In 2019, the North American waste management market reached $208 billion. Strict environmental regulations, as well as a surge in the amount of waste produced, is expected to expand the market even further. By 2027, the waste management market is expected to grow into a $229 billion industry. Anytime when I'm going to a landfill, I talk to my kids. You know, I talk to my son and daughter, they say, ah, yucky, you're going to come back as a smelly. I told them, you smell the trash and I smell money. America remains one of the most wasteful countries in the world, generating 239 million tons of garbage every year, about 16 or 1,700 pounds per person. While some view it as a threat to our environment and society, others see it as an opportunity. It's a profitable industry. It's a difficult industry, but it is profitable. It's done right, and I think that is why there are so many private companies that are involved in waste management. Thanks to advancements in modern chemistry and the support from the government, landfills have seen astonishing financial success in recent years, raking in millions of dollars in profit. Private solid waste management companies like Waste Management and Republic Services have shown significant growth over the last five years. They've learned how to be best-in-class businesses. And as they did that, what you saw was this growth occurring in new customer growth, new business formation linked with consumerism, consumer engagement, housing, and the garbage industry. Public traded stocks outperformed the market handily between 2015 and 2019. And underpinning it, is a meaningful improvement in their free cash flow conversion. So how exactly are landfills turning profit out of garbage? And just how much money can be made? When people think of landfills, they usually imagine an endless field of garbage emitting a terrible odor and housing all manner of pests. But modern sanitary landfills today are much more nuanced and a lot less smelly. A modern landfill is a civil engineering marvel. These are extraordinarily well engineered. They're designed to protect human health and the environment. And at the same time, contain and manage the waste that we generate at four and a half pounds a person per day in the United States. If you walk past the landfill and there is a smell, that means they are doing something wrong. Strict regulations and the work by the EPA have changed landfills to become more modern and sanitary than ever. The Solid Waste Disposal Act of 1965, combined with the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act of 1976, dramatically expanded the federal government's role in managing waste disposal. Open dumps where garbage is dropped off without any protection are now illegal. When waste is brought to a sanitary landfill, they are disposed into an open section known as the cell. This cell is protected by a layer of reinforced plastic known as the liner that prevents any harmful liquids from leaking out. Any liquid from the waste is collected at the bottom of the landfill and is removed via a series of pipes, gravels, and sand. Meanwhile, above ground, trash is constantly compressed within the cell using bulldozers and other compaction equipment, using daily covers to protect the trash from sun, rain, and pests until the cell reaches its max capacity. Once that happens, either a new cell begins on top or a final cover is placed over. The site is then continuously monitored for up to 30 years to ensure everything is environmentally sound. There is the potential for the liner system to leak, for example, over long periods of time. And probably more likely the cover system, you know, it's just going to be subject to that settling and, and weathering and different things. So there's the potential for gas emissions. You, you want to be monitoring a landfill as long as there's the potential for gas or liquid emissions. Landfills make a majority of their revenue even before the garbage makes its way to the pile of trash. Through a tipping fee or a gate fee, landfills charge trucks dropping off their garbage based on their weight per ton. This fee acts as the lifeblood of most landfills across the United States. Tipping fee gets its connotation because the truck comes in and tips, if you will. And it literally tips up when the trash is driven out of the, the trailer through what's known as a walking floor. So tipping is, it's your gate rate, it's the price per ton. And that is the principal source of income. In 2020, municipal solid waste landfills had an average tipping of $53.72 per ton. That translates to roughly $1.4 million a year in approximate average gross revenue for small landfills and $43.5 million a year for large landfills, just from gate fees. And tipping fees have seen steady growth over the past four decades. In 1982, the national average tipping fee sat at $8.07 per ton, or about $23 when adjusted for inflation. That's nearly a 133% increase in 35 years. Tipping fees vary widely depending on where the landfill is located. 
For instance, the South Central region in the U.S. has the lowest average tipping fee of $39.66 per ton, with some states like Arkansas reporting a fee as low as $30.53 per ton. On the other hand, the average tipping fee in the Northeast is almost double that at $68.69 per ton, with states like Delaware reporting a fee as high as $85 per ton. There's a list of reasons, but at its simplest level, is scarcity. So the, where tipping fees are the highest, I would venture that you have extraordinarily dense populations and very few disposal options. The other difference is the cost of building. If I'm in Western Pennsylvania dealing with rock formations at very shallow level, and then I literally go 50 miles west and go to Ohio, the, the cost of building a landfill in Western Pennsylvania versus Ohio are dramatic. While tipping fees make landfills sound like a risk-free business, they are still quite an expensive investment. It can cost about $1.1 to $1.7 million just to construct, operate, and close a landfill. And there are financial obligations that must be met even after the landfill has been closed entirely. There was a major regulatory change that happened in the 70s called the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. By 1994, every landfill that was in service in North America had to adhere to something called Subtitle D, which is the design operation and then the, the life cycle financial assurance obligations of managing and overseeing that site for 30 years after it closes. So every business owner, whoever owns the business, they make money up to the time it's working. Then even after closure, they have to pay the maintenance fee, which is runs around $1 million without making money for 30 years. That's part of their business operation. So they need to make money up front. Today, private companies have replaced municipal governments to own and operate the majority of landfills across the U.S. In 1988, about 7,900 landfills were publicly owned. By 2009, that number had fallen to about 1,900. It's now estimated that more than half of all municipal solid waste landfills are privately owned, with the industry controlling 85 to 90 percent of permitted capacity. Landfills are often owned by private companies. And I think it's because the trend has been to go larger and larger. So the, the small uh, neighborhood dump, you know, can't, can't exist because of the regulation and the sophistication of the design. So we're, we're tending to see large landfills, which we do require a lot of investment up front. Two private companies, Waste Management and Republic Services, lead the solid waste management sector. Waste Management says it owns nearly 300 landfills across the U.S., while Republic Service says it operates just over 180 out of the 2,627 landfills across America. Together, the two companies have seen staggering performance in the market, with both companies' stock prices doubling in the past five years. If you take the Great Recession uh, and, and sort of lay the framework of, of how did garbage perform post the Great Recession, um, what, what you'll discover, there's a five-year window up to 2014 where they did okay. They were, you know, they were in the green, matching or slightly outperforming the market, but the significant outperformance begins in 2014 through 2019. They've learned how to be best-in-class businesses. And as they did that, what you saw was this growth occurring in new customer growth, new business formation, linked with how, consumerism, consumer engagement, housing. And the garbage industry, public traded stocks outperformed the market handily between 2015 and 2019. And underpinning it is a meaningful improvement in their free cash flow conversion. Some government jurisdictions have also transitioned to a hybrid ownership. In places like Wake County, North Carolina, landfills are owned by the county but operated by GFL Environmental, a private company. So if you give it fully privatized, yeah, a private company will try to go through the regulation, but their main focus would be making money. To me, the combination of both is the best choice because that way city has certain control over the landfill company. They will look at only for the profit, but city also needs to make sure that not only the profit, the environmental sustainability, environmental cases and people's life, the case, everything is maintained in the right way. Private companies have also discovered new ways beyond tipping fees to turn profit out of their garbage. Landfill mining and reclamation, a process of extracting and reprocessing materials from older landfills, is one of them. Certainly looking at waste as a resource is um, the best thing for, for the economy, it's the best thing for the environment, for our health. Putting 
metal in a landfill it just makes absolutely no sense. It's just going to sit in the landfill forever and ever and ever. There'll be some corrosion, but but it's pretty much going to sit there. Whereas metals are so easy to to recover and recycle, uh, and and save so much money and energy and and so forth. In 2011, a private scrap metal company contracted with a nonprofit landfill in southern Maine to mine precious metals. In four years, they recovered over 37,000 tons of metal worth $7.42 million. But it isn't always a success story. In 2017, the city of Denton, Texas ended their landfill mining program before it could even start, after realizing that the benefits weren't worth its $4.56 million price tag. According to experts, economics is usually the biggest challenge to make landfill mining work. There's virtually no way I can see how that makes money. The commodity values would have to be at such higher levels than they are today, whatever it is you're trying to get your hands on. However, some experts claim that landfill mining can be profitable if done correctly. That's because mining can often recover the most valuable asset of any privately owned landfill, space. You get new tipping fee, right? You put the trash back into that mined space. So as if you build a new landfill without buying a new space. So that space gives you a lot of money when you start backfilling. Many people are mining, but they're not reusing the space. So they're saying, oh, okay, we cannot make money out of mining. Yes, you cannot. But if you do the operation right, you're never going to be involved. You will always make money. Modern chemistry has also allowed landfills to be mined for energy. When trash decays inside a landfill, it produces methane gas. For decades, regulations have required landfills to suck out this highly flammable gas and dispose of it safely. Landfill gas to energy projects, however, use the same gas to produce fuel and generate electricity for profit. The landfill gas operations that are known as low or medium BTU, which are predominant form of capture the gas, polish a little bit, turn it into electricity or steam and then sell it. Those are good return on capital projects. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, landfill gas generates about 10.5 billion kilowatt hours of electricity every year. That's enough to power roughly 810,000 homes and heat nearly 540,000 homes each year. I just did a paper where I was looking at how, how much electricity you can generate from landfills compared to how much energy we're using to produce electricity. And it's like less than 1%. I mean, it's, it's, it's a minor contributor to our heavy demands for energy in the U.S., but it's, you know, it's 1%. So, you know, it's, it, it's helpful if every, everything counts and if you're going to be extracting the gas for other reasons, you might as well uh, go ahead and do that if, if, you know, if it makes sense from, from an economic standpoint to, to generate electricity. But it's also a big investment. Landfill gas to energy projects can cost over $5 million to build and operate. While revenue from generating energy and fuel doesn't quite cover the cost, landfills do benefit greatly from generous subsidies. Many cities went into that landfill gas to energy because they get the carbon credit and they get money from the federal government. When they are producing the gas and capturing the gas, they are converting that into electricity. The amount of gas is you are capturing, you are reducing the greenhouse gas emission. That's why government was subsidizing, not only for carbon credit, subsidizing because you're reducing the greenhouse gas emission pressure on the environment. The tipping fee, combined with various mining techniques and government subsidies, have together transformed the landfill industry into a booming business. It's a profitable industry. It's a difficult industry, but it is profitable. It's done right, and I think that is why there are so many private companies that are involved in waste management. Solid waste management will only continue to expand as long as there are those who view garbage as a resource rather than waste. Because when it comes to landfills, one man's trash is quite literally another man's treasure. Waste is not a waste, but it's a resource. Because if you don't recycle the plastic, if we don't recycle the paper, if we don't recycle the paper, what are we going to do? We are going to go and cut more trees. If we don't recycle the plastic, we are going to go after more bioproduct from gasoline. If we don't reuse the electronic material, we are going to keep mining virgin material. World has limited resource. If we don't reuse and recycle this, we cannot talk about circular economy. That will always be a talk in the tabletop discussion. 